we had dog content. We had yeah. dog videos. Like our Facebook page was wild with engagement yeah. and newsletter sign up and content. And so Bark Post was essentially a dog blog and did a good job of also driving traffic to the core commerce website as well. I feel like Bark went from um, like the startup in Chinatown to just becoming plastered everywhere. Yep. But then what, what, what was the thing that took it from, okay, this is a, uh, a great direct response channel that's building and adding a ton of revenue to like by the snap of a finger, this thing is now everywhere. You have to be willing to spend what it takes to learn. You have to pay for education. And if you just try and tiptoe your way into a channel like TV, you will wind up in a worse spot because you have no idea if you're supposed to 10 exit or you're supposed to cut it. Nick, the first decade in e-commerce was all about customer acquisition with Facebook, Google, and Snap. The next decade of e-commerce is going to be all about customer retention. Now, at the end of the day, you got to look at what's left in the bank account when all is said and done. What's contribution margin look like and how much profit is there that will fund my next purchase order or my next ad campaign? With your AOV, I bet your customers would have loved the loyalty program. When I was at Hint, our loyalty program was incredible, but it was too outdated. That's why I'm so excited that we're partnering with Tandem for this season. Tandem is the infrastructure that allows brands to launch their own branded credit cards in less than 48 hours. With branded cards from Tandem, you cut processing fees by 66% and use their suite of tools to improve your contribution margin by up to 10%. Book your demo with Tandem and see how branded payments can level up your business. If you go to ddc.creditcard in your browser, you'll even get a $100 Amazon gift card to take a demo. That's DTC. Dot credit card and book a demo to see how you can maximize contribution margin. All right, we are back with another episode of Limited Supply, season seven. We've got a very special guest here today, Rob. Hi. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Rob shuts, shuts the door. Rob shuts. Rob was, um, well, we met a couple years ago, probably through Twitter, maybe? Uh, somewhere on the internet. Somewhere on the internet. Yeah. And then somehow in real life. And then, um, yeah, I just think you have a very fascinating career, honestly. I've actually seen your career for a long time and thought it was very fascinating. I'm very honored but, uh, by that. It's I've very cool to sit here with you today. I think we're going to ask you some fun questions. Do you want to give us just a quick background of yourself and then sure. we'll start peppering you? Oh, I love being peppered. Um, and thanks again, guys, for having me on. This is exciting. Big, big fan. Fan of the pod. Um, yeah, so I'm Rob. Um, let's see where to start. So... Uh, my background, I kind of cut my teeth more in like the, the early age, I'd say, of growth and uh, direct-to-consumer. So I actually started out of school uh, doing like healthcare consulting. We'd help hospitals get rid of their paper and scan it in and um, go digital, which was a good job out of college and then got very boring over time. Yeah. Um, and I was also on the sales side and it took forever to get something done. You pitch someone, it would take two years to sign a contract. And then I started to hear about uh, the internet. You guys, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the internet. It's very hot right now. Heard about it? Yeah, it's it's up and coming. Um, and I started seeing like very early ads for Groupon, uh, and I remember thinking what a cool concept that was. And so I went up launching a daily deals competitor way back in the day in like 2009. It's called What's the Deal, um, and we were just out of Washington D.C., which is where I was at the time. And that was kind of my initial foray into. How does the internet work? Like selling things, getting people's credit cards. I was like walking around, knocking on doors, getting restaurants and spas to offer you know wow. half price deals. That's awesome. Living uh, Social was also based in DC. Right? They were. I'm surprised, I'm surprised that there were like a DC yeah, daily deal. That's hospital. where it's at. I mean, it's funny. We launched the same week as Living Social. Wow. Same exact week. They had like a whole shit load of money. We had about ten thousand dollars. I begged out of my parents. Yeah. Um, and I was also doing my full-time job yeah. still. Uh, Did you to set up the website and everything? Yeah, so I had a buddy from Penn State where I graduated. He was also like hungry to do something. And I was yeah. like, let's just try this thing. Like, it's not so complicated. We Can, can we sell a half-price massage? Let's figure it out. So he built the kind of back end. And then I would do all the marketing and uh, set up all the deals. Uh, do all the customer service. You know. What was the best deal you guys had? Oh, we had a half price uh, manicure and mimosa. Uh, this place in Dupont Circle in DC, crush, crushed every year. Um, 
So it was awesome. It was like such a cool experience and I had no idea what I was doing. Like it's just literally trying to figure it out. What were the uh, economics? So like if that was $100 to the customer, what were the economics behind that? So yeah, let's say it was face value $100 for Momosa and a manicure. We'd get them an offer for 50 bucks. We'd take X percent of that coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, and the deal for the business was like, hey, we'll bring you hundreds or thousands of new customers. Hopefully, you can hold on to some of those and they'll be long-term customers. Um, and you're not doing it based on marketing. You're doing it based on just performance, like people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so it was cool. It was a great way to like dip my toes into marketing, sales. Like I loved how quick the dopamine hit was from that. Like every single day, you had to send an email out every single day people would buy or not buy. So mm -hmm. you're like happy or sad that day. And how are you getting day. buyers? Really, really slowly and organically. Um, we had no money to do marketing. I didn't know what I was doing. <clears throat> we wound up really hustling to build the, the email newsletter because it was mostly about email. And so uh, we wound up seeing there was this opportunity, especially with like bars and restaurants, where we're like, hey, you're really slow on Tuesdays and, or Wednesdays. Like, Send out, like, give us a keg and let us throw a party on a Tuesday when you're going to be really slow. And we'll bring lots of people. So we basically email gated that party. We said, you can come and get two, three free drinks at this bar that you've heard of that you like, but you have to be on our email list. And so we would do that. And that eventually helped us grow. And we got some traction there. And then we did like a few partnerships, with magazines and different like publications that wanted to get into deals, but didn't really know how to do it. So we were very like methodical and organic versus like your living socials, just like plowed money into yeah. pay channels because they actually knew what they were doing. Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, certainly on the uh, on the acquisition side. Sure. Um, and yeah, that was kind of like a really cool opportunity to learn. And then it got to a point where like deals were so hot. Deals were so hot. Like. It was so competitive to get a restaurant to do a deal. Living Social was giving people an iPad. They would like give them an iPad in order to sign up for a deal. And we just had like me and my buddy. Like yeah. give the restaurant an iPad in yeah. order so they do a deal with us? Yeah. Because it. it was Groupon was hitting them up. We were hitting them up. You know, uh, Living Social. And there was like tons and tons of clones out there. How big did the email list get? Our email list wasn't huge. It was under 100K. Okay. Uh, but it was incredibly engaged like now that i've actually learned how this works yeah, it's yeah. like holy shit the amount yeah. of like engagement and clicks we got it was do you like, remember your open rate back in the day i was probably like 60 70 percent yeah um it, it was like wild uh but is of course if you're just growing with people who actually want your product you're gonna get a lot better engagement versus yeah. you know you're putting money into all these like growth tactics you're obviously the quality is going to go down there. And there's okay. just so many more emails you get today from like yeah. random institute, right? Like last decade has just been like, everyone has realized email is the way to reach people in a cheap and effective community. As a cheap yeah. And effective community. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I think that's also made me appreciate, like <clears throat> I've kind of seen the through line in my career where like, I love email. I'm still a big proponent of email yeah. in general. I think a lot of that comes from like my initial upbringing on the deal space where like everything was driven by email. It yeah. was like, you have to get a good list. You have to have high engagement. You have to put good creative together. And if you do that and you couple that with good product or a good deal, you will probably sell, you know, you'll sell well that day. Yeah. Um, so I just love how quickly you could like put something out there and then get feedback sure. immediately. Like if someone buys within 10 seconds of an email going out, you're like, hell awesome. yeah. That and feels what, good. what year was this? It was 2009. So uh, <clears throat> what were you using for like, how would you process payments? Was it Stripe? This is pre-Stripe. Um, I don't even remember what payment processor we're using, to be honest. Were you using MailChimp for emails? No, we were using, uh, <laughs> it no longer exists. I remember it was a company called Mailbato. Um, but everything was just like, <clears throat> this was kind of pre all these good tools yeah, <laughs> being put out there where you just yeah. kind of cobble it together. And so like, you know, I would talk with like the guy, it was like a guy who ran this ESP Mailbato. And I've, I've, um, uh, we were using authorized.net. That was our payment mm -hmm. processor. Yeah. And everything was just clunky, but it was a great learning opportunity. And then deals got so hot that like Groupon was going public, Living Social was sure. going to get acquired for like $5 billion. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't really know. Am I supposed to raise money? Am I supposed to expand into other cities? And so I wound up like cashing in some of my chips and I got meetings with some of the bigger players at the deal companies and I was just 
trying to sell the company. Um, and so I got really lucky. I wound up selling to a competitor in New York, actually, called KGB, KGB Deals. Um, and we sold the company in 2011. And I was just really happy to be like out of that game. It mm -hmm. didn't necessarily feel like it was going to be sustainable over the long term. Uh, and it felt like a nice like chapter in my career where I could pivot from like, I used to be doing healthcare consulting and now I'm like an entrepreneur and I know how to do the internet. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So that was, that was a, a, a big turning point for me professionally. It's such a confidence builder as well to find like a small early exit when you uh, are young to be like, okay, I can make this work. And to give yourself like enough financial security to start, uh, like to try it again or to join an early startup and to not go back and be like, I need to get a corporate job because yeah. this didn't work out. I uh, Yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. I think there were some good lessons learned out of it too because I think I came out of the other side of that being like, I'm an entrepreneur and I yeah. know what the fuck I'm doing yeah. and I'm going to, I'm just going to think of an idea and build some stuff. Yeah. And I definitely wasted some time and money building out things that, uh, did not get any traction <laughs> whatsoever. And in hindsight, like I should have been much more strategic about where I was spending time and money. Um, ideas that I still like, like I built this, um, basically an app called chirp guide. And the whole idea was like, I want to do TV guide for Twitter. So like everyone's live tweeting Real Housewives or sports, like yeah. should be a place where you can go and yeah. you put together your own stream. I want a comedian and an ex-athlete and, you know, sports commentators. I want to see a live tweet stream of those people while I watch this game. Mm. And then if I watch it later, if I'm watching it two days later, I want to be able to play back that stream yeah. just like it's live. It's not a bad idea. Still. I love the idea. Yeah. But it was so far away from monetization, right? Yeah. You had to like build it, get people on board, like have enough traction that you can then sell the advertising. It was like, oh my God. And I didn't realize that until I was, I had spent some real time and money. Um, so it was good. But I think what I realized coming out of that was like, I'm an entrepreneur, but I, I'm like a generalist. You know, I'm not necessarily, yeah. maybe I'm an ideals person. Maybe I'm an operator. Maybe I'm a marketer. I'm not really sure. And what I like, what was important for me in figuring out my next step was like, I kind of had to pick a path where I had to say like, I'm going to go be a marketer. And that, that's where I wound up. But it was like, I was too generally, I, I was too generalized in order to actually like even join a company when I was pitching myself as kind of this entrepreneur. I get coffee with people and they're like, cool, what do you do? Like, how could you help the company? I'm like, I could help in many ways. Like, do you need a salesperson? Do you need a marketer? Do you need yeah. like a co-founder? And people are like, I, I don't really know if this guy is really good at anything specific. So the turning point for me was like, I actually did some um, teaching at General Assembly uh, here in New York. And I was I wound up on the user acquisition management team, uh, working with my friend, now good friend, Kate Hewitt. Um, over at Bombas. And what I realized there was like, I'm just going to lean into this. This seems pretty good. And I'm just going to make this my path, right? Where then you kind of user acquisition. Yeah. User acquisition management was kind of like, it was before growth was even like. Yeah. And this there. was at General Assembly. You just took a class or? I was TAing a class with Kate. Okay, nice. Um, How did you get that? That was just coincidence? Yeah. It was like my, fr my cousin's girlfriend worked at GA. And wow. She was like, hey, they need a TA for this thing. You've done this stuff. And I was like, right. Um, and then I realized like all of these things that I've been doing on the deal side actually had like names. Like the email stuff I've been was like, oh, email acquisition and like engagement metrics. And I was like, oh, these are things that I've actually done and I kind of know. I just didn't know they were things. Yeah. Um, that's what I found about like all these other channels and different ways you could do stuff. And I was like, okay, I like this stuff. I'm just gonna like this is gonna be my path. So then I kind of like repackaged all my experience and now I was like a user acquisition management expert. Um, and that's when I then realized uh that it was probably time to get a job because i tried a, a bunch of these different ideas i was just getting married uh, i'd wasted you know um i'd wasted some money and i was like it's probably time to get a job so i'm gonna go out there now as like this user acquisition management professional you know put on put <laughs> on so my business suit teaching it so you're like now i'm the perfect i must be a good <laughs> i i mean I'm I, a teacher yeah i'm a teacher so i must know something yeah. Um, but it was also so early that like yeah. no one really was an yeah, expert at that time. Yeah, you're buying Facebook likes at this point. You're yeah. posting posts. It was There's pre no, like, pre yeah. newsfeed ads. Yeah. Pre newsfeed right. ads. Yeah. 
Um, and that's when I went, I remember went to a career fair. It was like a cool career fair. They had like beer and like skateboarders in the background. Uh, I forget the name of it. It was here in the city. Um, and the armory on Lexington. No, it was like right on like 22nd, 23rd. Uh, it'll come to me, but, uh, I met with a couple companies and I wound up talking with the BarkBox team. And I was like, I like dogs. Dogs are cool. Um, and they had a booth there? They had a booth there. Wow. It was the f- four of them at the time. It was like uh, four or five of them at the time. It was like a couple of the co-founders and um, like they had an operations yeah. person and tech person. And we, I've always been a dog person. My wife and I are big dog people. Um, and just really liked what they were building. And I love the idea of being able to like advertise with dogs. Like that's kind of cheating, right? We can use yeah, like sure. Cute pictures yeah. and videos of dogs as your ad creative. Yeah. Um, so I met with them and they're like a fun, quirky, weird bunch who kind of hit it off um, pretty quickly. And they said, yeah, you want to come in and like be a user acquisition marketing yeah. person here? And I was like, great. So that was in... 2011, 2012. Um, And it was great. You know, it was a really small team. It was a first marketing hire. We had this like janky ass office in Chinatown where you had to like buzz. I remember the interview, uh, the interview email I got from Matt Meeker, who's still there as a CEO. And he was like, hey, go to this address, like just buzz all the numbers. Someone will let you in. And then you're going to get to an elevator. There's a sign that says no spitting. So don't spit. I was like, is that a, that wouldn't have been my first inclination, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. now I'm thinking about it. Um, and then you like buzz for the elevator and then like a dude comes down on the elevator, right? He comes down, wow. and opens okay, the door. Old, oh, wow. old, 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 old school. Operator. So you're in there with Mr. Lin. You tell him go on the sixth floor. He shuts it. You don't talk. You don't look him in the eyes. Um, and then you got up to sixth floor and you know, like in this kind of startup space. Yeah. Um, and so went up there and viewed and that's where we were for the first, like maybe year, year and a half. Um, and it was just kind of this right place, right time experience where 2012 is like 2013 is when it all started to happen. Like I remember Facebook newsfeed ads launched a couple months in and I was like sitting at my desk, I had money. I was in charge of user acquisition and marketing. And like, I leaned into it really hard. And it was like, oh, shit. First day I did it, we got like 15 new people for like $5 each. And I was like, this seems good. Yeah. Like, we should keep doing this. Yeah. Um, and there's like a crop of companies who are around uh, that time frame that really benefited from yeah. like... Harry's. Harry's, yeah. You know, Warby. Like, yeah. where a lot of those folks were like in a similar position. They had s- some funding they were looking for growth. They were quick and nimble, uh, and really, really leaned in early on on the Facebook side. There's a crazy story of like um, getting uh, Facebook ads or like getting newsfeed ads approved, which was Zuck was completely against them for the longest time, mm-hmm. and finally, two people were in his office, which is called the Aquarium because it's like all glass, and um, he said, uh, "Okay, like they were like, oh look, there's nobody is engaging with these ads. Like you know, our ads are kind of terrible." And he's like, why don't we just put them in the news feed? Like, just do that. And rather than say one other thing, which is what they, they've always wanted that, right? Because they're yeah. like, this is where everyone's going to click ads. They just got up and left. Because they're like, if we say one more thing, he might take it back. So just leave right now. Do not say one more word. And let's get the news feed ads going. Really change the history oh, of Facebook. That's amazing. Yeah. So, what, like, you were employee, but going back to you, um, this job fair is bananas. So you go to a job fair and you're em- I looked at your LinkedIn profile before you got here. You're employee number seven there. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe that like you join um such an iconic brand from going to a job fair. From I'm a like, TA. what are they doing at a job fair? You know, there's six of them. Like, that you too know- from accidentally being a TA. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that was through like a family thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Just coincidence. Yeah. Wow. But you know, I think and I heard you guys talk and tweet about it too, but I think it's all of the this concept of like creating more surface area to get lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think it's one of those where like, you just kind of got to be around. Yeah. You got to be hanging around stuff that's totally. interesting and that you like and yeah. allow for these things serendipitously. Do you remember? To happen. Yeah. Do you have to, uh, did you have to have a resume? Did you like hand him a resume? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hand him a resume. Okay. I went back like a few years ago and I was looking at our initial email exchanges, uh, which is just, 
hilarious. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd like handed them a resume and followed up and waiting to hear back. And what and, was the interview process like when they were <laughs> The interview process was like, I remember it was Matt, Henrik, and Carly, three co-founders, and we were just all in a room. And I don't think I talked all that much. They were just kind of like, you know, shitting on each other and being weird. And like, they're asking me questions. And it was like more of almost like a, can you fit into this vibe yeah, type yeah. of interview than like, tell me your hard skills. Yeah. And then at some point I went through like, here's my 20 ideas for how we would grow it. And they're like, sounds great. Yeah. Um, but they were in an interesting situation where like Matt was coming off of, um, he was at like a VC um, dog patch labs, like yeah. incubator. And uh, Carly was the first New York GM of uh, Uber. And Henrik has this venture studio out of New York um, called Prehype. Um, and so, like, they were also initially not looking to, like, get super involved. Carly was. But Matt and Henrik were looking to get more, like, build this business and then hand it off to other people. And so they were kind of, like, kicking the tires on, like these people have our vibe that we're bringing in and early employees. It's so important to make sure from a culture perspective. Uh, but yeah, we, we've laughed about it, but it was, um, it was unique, uh, anyway, anyway you slice it. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. We, I, I actually tried to raise money from Henrik at pre-hype, uh, with native, you know, long, long time. Well, ago. did he give you money? He didn't. Ugh. He, I remember I sent him a sample and he's like, this gave me a rash. I'm not going to use this and I'm not going to invest. <laughs> I get it. No I mean, that's that is fair yeah, feedback, yeah, completely but fair. you know, I don't blame him. But it's still a miss. Um, uh, and so, like, I looked at uh, BarkBox's number. So, BarkBox, uh, for the people who don't know, basically is a subscription or primarily a subscription for dog treats and dog or like pet treats and pet toys. Dog, yeah, it's dog, dog only. Okay, dog. Yep. Only. Um, I looked at your numbers. So, so I don't know when you you joined in 2012. I don't know what those numbers look like. In 2014, you're at a 25 million dollar run rate. Is that primarily just off the back of meta advertising? Yeah, I mean, we really leaned hard into meta out of yeah. the gate. I think, um, you know, in retrospect, this is this advice I give earlier stage founders a lot, having learned and doing this incorrectly. In retrospect, like, we should have spent even more time and money there. Yeah. Um, there's this feeling, and I definitely felt it, where it's like, we're not diversified. Like, we have too much you know, too much money in this one channel. What if it goes away? And like, yes, of course, at some point you look to diversify. But I kind of went off on this search where I was like, cool, I did Facebook. Check. I'm going to hand it off to, I'm going to hand it off to some other people that are going to take it. I'm going to go find the next Facebook. And I feel like I spent a couple of years mm -hmm. searching. And then eventually it was like, God damn it. I should have just tripled down on this channel and we yeah. would have we would have I went seen through that too at one point I'm sure you did too Definitely. I feel like everybody like finds success on Facebook and then it's like now we gotta percent. diversify yeah and then you go try to find the next fit it just doesn't exist and it's not always Facebook right yeah. it's like whatever channel is actually working for you I'll yeah. talk to people that are like you know they're six months in and they're finding like so much success on like TikTok influencer. We gotta, we gotta do this other things. We gotta try Usually other stuff. Things. And it's like <laughs> it's well, or it could be search. It could be, yeah. you know, I've Fair definitely enough. seen other people, you know, content, um, uh, organic social like lean into what is working for you. Don't fight against what is working for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was the same way. Yeah. I also was like, I need to diversify channels, I need to get Pinterest. I, I so first let me start by saying in your defense, in 2014, it was Everyone thought there would be alternatives to Facebook. Of course. Oh, right? absolutely. Pinterest launch and everyone's absolutely. like, this is an alternative. Like, there were so many options. Or, like, Facebook wasn't the behemoth that it is today. Yeah. And it wasn't yeah. as, like, sophisticated with its algorithm as it is today. Oh, absolutely. And so everyone was like, yes, let me diversify. Even, you know, when I was running a Mint Native, I was like, uh, I need to diversify. And now I look back on it and I'm like, why didn't I just triple everything all the time? Yeah. Um, and... Warren Buffett has this great saying, which is, when it's raining opportunity, don't put out thimbles, put out buckets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if Facebook is working for you, like usually when I see people who are like trying to diversify away from Facebook, I'm like, it's not working for you. And that's why you're doing it. If it was working, you should be doing the opposite. Yeah. Just yeah. focus on it. Yeah. Because the reality is, especially if you're an earlier stage company or you have a smaller team, you have limited yeah. resources, like you can split that across a Reddit test and a Pinterest test. No, just lean into yeah, what yeah, is totally. working yeah. and, and take like take the wins. Um, so yeah, that was that was definitely and it's funny you mentioned that like the early days and the algorithm. I remember how unsophisticated it was, where like you couldn't even day part. You couldn't even you like you would be running ads 
24 hours if you're running ads. This is binary. So I remember like setting my alarm clock at 1 a.m. I would turn off ads and then I'd wake up at 6 a.m. and turn them back on because it was being really wasteful over the course of like uh the those night five hours. yeah those five hours but you couldn't actually change and the algorithm wasn't at a point where it would like learn so you just have to do all these things really really manually wow. but that's kind of what you need to do in the early yeah, days yeah, is yeah. like you get you know you you do what you got to do to win that's insane okay so also in 2014 you're a 25 million dollar run rate all of a sudden you guys are launching an insane number of products there's bark box there's bark post do you remember bark post? Oh, oh absolutely bark care Bark yeah. Buddy, Bark, Bark Cam. Yeah. Oh, you're you've you've gone deep. You're going deep. What's going like? Yeah. Tell me what <laughs> like. Uh, is it sort of like you feel invincible? Is is the company feel invincible? Like I feel like that's what happens when people are like, you know, Casper when they were out there, uh, and they also took advantage of the, this early days of. Facebook. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They were like, we're launching, and like I think they hired like the guy from the New York Post or some like le pretty legitimate publication to launch their newsletter, like, Van Winkle. like a blog. Yeah, it was you know? Van Winkle. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. That's what it was. And I was like, what's going on here? You guys have now decided that you're like a legitimate publishing organization. They're, and, you know, and that's fair. But like, um, you know, you just have this feeling of invincibility. You can do anything and nothing can go wrong. Yeah. Is that the case well, or not the case? Um, certainly not the feeling that nothing could go wrong. Because okay. while you're doing all these things, you're also, I will say, learning and failing constantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have to remember at that time, too, like, even taking the Facebook algorithm, right? Like, the organic part of that was massive. Yeah. And a lot of businesses yes. built themselves off of that as well. And, yeah. like, again, we had dog content. We had yeah. dog videos. Like, our Facebook page was wild with engagement yeah. and newsletter sign up and content. And so, Bark Post was just a, was essentially a blog. It was, it was the, yeah. um, it was, it was a dog blog. Um, and did a good job of also driving traffic to the core commerce website as well. So that was more just like, let's launch that. Let's formalize that. There was a bunch of interesting things in there. Like Bark Buddy was kind of like a little skunk project, but that was like essentially Tinder for dog adoption. Just like, hey, yeah. there's dogs in your area. You <laughs> yeah. want to adopt it? Awesome. It's kind of like a fun, like a fun thing. And then what was it? Oh, Bark Care. Yeah, Bark Care was in there. That was like ahead of its time. That was essentially like, Uber for vets. Uber for vets. I need oh, a wow. vet to come to my house and uh, my dog is sick yeah. and you pay on a you know per visit basis, whatever. I still actually think it's a really good product and people are trying to do that now. Yeah. But it was, you know, at that stage, it's very operationally heavy. You yeah. have to have overhead and staff and you have to build out at each city level. And different organizations are built different ways where like we were built more, I would say, as a single um, entity that could broadcast and advertise nationally and take advantage of that and not necessarily like an expert in local logistics and yeah. operations. Um, it was also just a different type of product, right? Where it's like, how do you target someone who needs a vet right now? Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to show up in someone's newsfeed yeah. at the right time. That's like further up the funnel. It's a different muscle when it yeah. comes to marketing. So didn't work, uh, but a lot of good lessons, I think, out of, uh, you know, taking away like yeah, again, time sensitivity and urgency and marketing strategy and operations. So no uh, no qualms about that, but plenty of plenty of swings and misses along the way. Yeah, and a lot of like um, ideas that, you know, like you're right, Bark Care is sort of like a business, to, can be a huge business today, but it's also very hard to be like a segment of a business, right? Because like local logistics, yeah, yeah. you know, like look at what DoorDash and yeah. have to do in order to make sure that yeah. like, that car shows up and that food delivery. But that happens all the time as, as companies grow. And it's why like yeah. startups exist, right? Yeah, it's like, right. hey, there's big company. They're not nearly nimble enough to do this very small thing for this segment of people. And But five people that are just 100% dedicated to it can totally pull it off. So it's it's interesting. And it's, it all comes back to like this, like building a perfect product for a perfect subset of people versus trying to build something so broad that it's applicable to everyone. And so is there like... Um like, uh, I guess, tell me a little bit about what, like, what the ethos and culture was in 2014. Was it sort of like, look, BarkBox is doing really well. We just went from, I don't know, $5 million to $25 million in a couple of years. There's fundraising to be had, and we need to go and conquer the pet care industry. Or was it more like, um, is that what it was? It was or, like, I feel like today, very few e-commerce businesses would be like, let me get into local logistics. Because yeah. They like, you know, or was it just like, hey, look, the the forest is green, but no one has chopped this wood before, so we don't know where we can succeed. Yeah, you know there. 
the joke when I got would get on calls with vendors, like joke we got every time is like, are you gonna launch a box for cats? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um and <laughs> the reality was like the the founding team was always very clear, like, we are building a company for dogs. This is not a pet company. Yeah. This is not like you don't get your hamster food on our website. Like it's it's about bringing joy to dogs. Yeah. And so that at least was a a focused way to look at it where there was less pressure to expand into all these different potential categories. Uh, but it was really about maximizing dog joy and less of like the commoditized products that everyone sells and we're also going to sell it. It was like, what's something that's super fun? Um, so that kind of that kind of led a lot of the innovation and product development. Um, and, you know, the, you get some wins out of that. You get yeah. some yeah. swings and misses. But um, I think high level, uh, it helped the team really focus on just like this subset. Okay, Nick, I went to Long Weekend's website and I used Weekend Pay when I checked out. I know that's powered by Tandem. Can you tell me what the hell Weekend Pay is? Yes, so Tandem's awesome. Have you ever gone to JetBlue's website or the Macy's store and been asked to sign up for their credit card? That's because the stores benefit from lower processing fees, higher shopper AOV, higher customer loyalty, and a higher repeat purchase rate. Tandem allows any Shopify brand to build their own branded credit card system. Previously, you had to be a billion dollar a year brand to go to a big bank and build a branded credit card with them. I've actually gone down that path to see what's possible, and that's how I actually discovered Tandem. The same team that built this at Capital One for brands is now making it so that any DTC brand can immediately launch a branded credit card. On top of that, with Tandem, you can focus on contribution margin. Many of the brands launching with Tandem are seeing a 10% increase in contribution margin from the program. 2024 is the year to focus on profit. To learn more about Tandem, open your browser and enter dtc.creditcard and then press enter. Book a demo with the amazing team at Tandem. And if you're a brand that does over $5 million a year, you'll get a $100 Amazon gift card. Again, go to dtc.creditcard to make more profit. So I was looking at the 10K for BarkBox um, and the CAC, it's great. I love looking at 10Ks. The CAC for BarkBox today is $58.20 for a new okay. subscriber. Do okay. you have any idea what it was, you know, it, it, when you were running? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, when we started, it was yeah. a couple bucks, yeah. right? Wow. Um, when you're when you're able to take advantage yeah. of was that Was that like, did that feel like a casino? Like that must have <laughs> had to feel like the biggest high in the world. You know, it's like when you're in it, you don't necessarily realize it. It's looking back. It's like, yeah. oh man. I feel the opposite. <laughs> I feel like when I was at Hint and we were scaling so fast, I felt like I was on drugs for two years straight. Well, you were also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, it, I mean, but that's also the, that's like why we do what we do too. It's just because you're chasing that feeling of yeah. like, I'm doing this thing and it's working. We're getting people and we're getting money. <laughs> yeah. And like the money part is good, but it's like the feeling of winning. Right. Um. But yeah, I mean, definitely felt good to see that work. And like that was helping really pace the company. We were able to hire more people. We were able to build up the team. Like, And did you have products. like, did you have, because at that time it was you and uh, you were the seventh person. So were there, uh, like how mature was the company? Did it feel like a fresh startup or were you coming in and building out a plan or were you just like, I'm just going to run ads and then it just started growing so fast? I don't think anyone just would describe the early days of... BarkBox is mature yeah. um, for multiple reasons. Uh, but I think it was a combination, right? It was, you know, we'd raise some venture money and there's expectations and we needed to build out plans, et cetera. But it was also very nimble and flexible based on what was going on. A small yeah. team and really out there to like win in this space. Um, so yeah, it was it was a good combination, I think, of like quick, nimble, able to make fast decisions, yeah. but also have real, you know, money behind it and expectations came along with it. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So, yeah, you said the early days it was $2. Do you remember how it got, like, you know, how, uh, I'm just curious. I love Yeah, that. I mean, it's just a step, it was just a step up every year, yeah. right? Every quarter, where it's very clearly becoming more competitive yeah. in these areas. Um, and then, you know, we were also trying to diversify, doing a yeah. lot of different things, did TV, did sponsorships, you know, content, um, tried all the channels, like literally, all the channels available at the yeah. time. Uh, ran some Groupons, did a little throwback. Really? Uh, yeah, did highly you run successful. Into KGB? <laughs> we did not. At okay. that point, they, I don't believe they were it still operating. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was as you would expect. It was just increasing competition. We also saw more like copy cats, copy dogs, I guess, um, pop up where people are trying to do the same thing, yeah. you know. And then it's like, oh, how are you differentiating from these other people? And it's really interesting that there are no real competitors left for that business because it's yeah. a tough business. It's a tough business, um, and you have to have scale in order to really make it work. Like initially, we were buying toys and treats and then putting them in the box and reselling them. And now it's at the scale where you're sending to millions and millions of people a month where you're actually creating our own, you know, creating Bark's own treats, own toys. They're all themed, you know. Like you have to have scale in order yeah. to really do that or else you can't kind of create this magical experience. Early on, were you actually like going to PetSmart to buy them? And like, like you know, the guys who run Nature Box, you remember Nature Box? Yes. Oh, yeah. They were like, we went to Whole Foods, bought almonds and then like sent them, like yeah. bagged them up. It wasn't exactly like that, yeah. uh, but it was, you know, working on more like wholesale relationships with yeah. uh, oh, manufacturers yeah, and yeah. providers. But yeah, not not too far off. Yeah. Uh, I know we got to get to row pretty soon. Yeah, I just have one more question yeah, please. here. Yeah, I got one more too. Well, That's right. So I feel like Bark went from um, like the startup in Chinatown to just becoming plastered everywhere. Yep. And it sounds like some of the early wins were probably around Facebook ads. Yep. But then what what, what was the thing that took it from, okay, this is a uh, a great direct response channel that's building and adding a ton of revenue to – like by the snap of a finger, this thing is now everywhere. Yeah. Like, was it a specific channel or a specific campaign or was it just putting a bunch of money into a bunch of channels? Yeah. It's, you know, and also, do you think it's still possible to do that today or is it much harder to do that today because of all the places that consumers consume content? Yeah. Um, I'll start with the first part. I mean, the things that come to mind that I think really started to change the game were, one, we just moved further up the funnel. So we started doing TV. We started doing, you know, out of home. Yep. Um, which, and were all these like 10K tests that you just kept scaling? It's funny. TV, I, another lesson learned from doing it wrong the first time. TV, I remember we shot our first ad. Actually, remember I was on the ground holding a dog's legs down so they would get out of frame. Um, and we, we shot our first ad and we really tried to dip our toe in. Like, can we do 25K? test of TV. Um, and unsurprisingly, we, we ran it and we just had no idea if it worked or not. And that's the that's like one thing I've learned. And I try and talk with folks who are looking at these channels that are further up the funnel is like, you have to be willing to spend what it takes to learn, you have to pay for education. And if you just try and tiptoe your way into a channel like TV, you will wind up in a worse spot because you have no idea if you're supposed to 10 exit or you're supposed to cut it. Right. It's different than a digital channel where you're like, you're looking at the metrics and you can figure out, is this worth, can I scale, can I scale a little bit more, should I Should I back off? But channels like that, you need to like really put money in the game and it saves you money in the long run. So every quarter you're not doing the same thing, we're going to do another 25, oh, we'll do 35. And then you fast forward a year, you've, you've spent 100 at 50K, but you right. haven't done it at a frequency enough or at a high enough level where you actually know, should I just... Get rid of that whole team or yeah. get rid of that agency or should I blow this, you know, the fuck out? So I think that was helpful uh, just from a funnel perspective. And then I think the other thing that really was a benefit was organic social. Like we crushed organic yeah. social and we had a great team. Um, shout out Stacey Grissom from back in the day um, where, you know, we started the Instagram channel when it was, you know, that was very, very early. Um, my wife and I actually started the Instagram channel before we passed it to the team. Um, but for Barkbox for Barkbox, yeah. Wow. Um, and we the figured out phenomenal. By the way, content's great. It's, it's very social first. It's very social first. It's very weird. It's very on brand. Um, and what we figured out, I remember we figured out this hack, which was like, if we post a cute picture of a dog with like a funny caption um, at like four o'clock during the week we'll hit the favorites page. Mm -hmm. And so there was there was like a calendar I made of like, we were going to post at this time and this type of content. And we'd hit the favorite page and our followers would just explode every time we hit the favorite page. So we built that account up and we were getting so much engagement and so many different opportunities that came out of that. That's to your second question, Nick, like, can you do this anymore? Like that, that arbitrage doesn't exist anymore. Right? Yeah. Like that has been like the closed. full blanket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we were able to really lean into organic social and content and video. And we had these like 
fun creators who were there that would shoot weird video. There was like a, there was a guy, Jonathan, who was there who has a dog noodle who actually like became huge, got a book deal and like became a huge personality. There was like a lot of celebrity dogs that came through Bark. Yeah. Um, was that also a, a big driver of growth? Or would they not convert? I've always been curious. Which which part? Uh, so like dog influencers, basically. Dog influencers. Well, <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. We could do a whole podcast of dog <laughs> influencers. But we initially created this um, affiliate program we called the Bark Pack, which was like 500 influencer dogs on Instagram. Everyone's building these accounts with their dogs because people would engage with them, but they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. They're like, I have like, 100,000 followers for my dog. What am I supposed to do with it? So we were really the first ones was reaching out. I was like, can I pay you money? And we'll send you bark boxes every month and you post about it. And they were like, amazing. That sounds great. So we created bark pack. We gave them each individual codes. You know, they would all post at the same time and it would kind of like flood the internet all at once. Hashtag bark box Firefly day. style. Yeah, it was the thunderclap. Yeah. Thunderclap right there. Um, but yeah. I mean, I think it definitely had an impact. I think things got murky with like code redemptions and things showing up on coupon websites, blah, blah, blah. But like net net, it was a positive. Yeah. Um, I think we would have done it differently if we had been more thoughtful about attribution. But certainly from the perspective of like being everywhere, uh, like having BarkBox be ubiquitous, I think that was a, that was a very helpful driver. That's crazy. Um, okay, I want to move on because uh, I, I have so many more questions about BarkBox. Oh, we can t- we can do a little side combo. Uh, but we got to talk about Row. Um, so you ended up... So, so I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. And it looked like you were at BarkBox and started to moonlight for Row right when you guys launched. Is that right? Yeah, so I met Z and Saman, who became my co-founders at Row, uh, while I was at Bark. They were all kind of in the pre-hype ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and oh, really? we're in the same building. Bark, at that time, different office in Chinatown, but we were on like basically all the floors uh, uh, and Prehype was on the fifth floor. And so... Well, did it get like incubated out in Prehype? Not really. Okay. Uh, it depends on if you ask Henrik. If you ask, <laughs> if you ask Henrik, it absolutely did. Um, but it was, you know, Z and Saman were kind of doing different projects at uh, Prehype. They are incredibly talented guys in a bunch of different areas, but uh, don't know a lot about marketing. So they would always come over like, hey, how do you do Facebook ads? What's the landing? Yeah. Like, how do we do landing page optimization? Um, and we started talking. I, and then I had been at Bark for about five years and was kind of getting itchy for something entrepreneurial again. And they were looking to start this company. And we met a couple of times. We talked about different ideas. And I was like very much on the fence because we were having our second kid. We just bought a house in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, Bark also had, I think they still have, I don't know, uh, this uh, sabbatical policy. If you're there for five years, you get three months paid off. And so I was coming up on that, which I was looking forward to. Um, and then I started talking to the guys. And I was like, oh, this seems like a good opportunity. Uh, like these are pretty unique individuals. And so I was kind of going back and forth and then sat down with Jamie, my wife. And I was like, I don't know. What do you think? Should we do this? Because <laughs> anyone in a relationship uh, knows that you can't make these types of jump without full full support at home uh, from your partner. And so she was like, very wise. She's very wise. And she was like, are you going to look back and regret not doing this if you don't do it? And I was like, definitely. She's like, just do it. Let's yeah. just do it. So wound up figuring out with the guys how I could take a small salary while I was moving over and doing this and, you know, let the Bark team know. And they were like super supportive of their first checks in first checks in oh, uh, to the business. Wow. The Bark uh, team. The Bark team. Yeah. Um, and felt really good because that's like where I grew up and I yeah. felt very supported and I felt a lot of allegiance towards that team as well. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, started kind of like doing double duty a little bit in 2017. And, you know, the first thing we did was we actually got an office on uh, 18th, uh, 20th and Broadway where we started building out a pharmacy. We had to build our own physical pharmacy location and go through licensing and all those pieces. And so we had, it was like really important to get a physical location. So we had an office before basically anything else. Um, and then, yeah, through the course of that year, I transitioned over and that, the beginning of the row story. Wait, I'm sorry. And how did you g- meet the row guys? It was in the uh, it was in the pre hype building. You just like randomly walked in, like you know. I had so Saman um, um, had done some work for Bark early back in the day. He's like a product and design and tech yeah. kind of person. Very unique set of skills there. And so he had done some work for Bark. I knew him from that. He was always a really. Got it. I had kind of 
bookmarked. I was like, if that guy ever comes up for air, I should talk to him. And he went on to start a company in New York called Managed by Q, uh, which was a smart office cleaning company. And then he rolled off of that and it was kind of like thinking about what was next. And I was like, keep track of that guy. Then he introduced me to Z. Z uh, had been through Y Combinator. He had a company called Shout uh, that he actually closed down. And then he was kind of like hanging around. Yeah. Um, and so pre-hype, they joke it's kind of like a halfway house for uh, co-founders. And so the two of them were like hanging around and they needed like a complimentary third stool, to, uh, leg gotcha. to the stool. Yeah. Um, and that was what attracted me to them as well. It was like the three of us together have basically all the skills we need to build a company. We could go build whatever we want, but like I can handle the marketing and the comms and the and the growth. And, you know, Z had great investor relationships and his dad's a really well-known doctor and he had like the healthcare issues that he was comfortable talking about publicly. And sure. I told him, I'm going to put you on TV yeah. talking about erectile dysfunction. Are you comfortable with that? And he was like, if you promise me it works, I will go on TV. And I was yeah. like, I promise. Uh, and then Z, uh, and sorry, and then Saban, you know, uh, more with like the tech design um, product background, felt like really unique opportunity to work with people that had such complementary skills. And so we had started chatting from there. there Saban was like, hey, come, come on a walk with us. We're going to like, let's go and walk and get lunch. And, um, you know, just started chatting from there. Uh, and what was like, you know, you're early on in, uh, at row. You have to build this pharmacy. Are you mailing stuff out from your pharmacy? Like, uh, yeah, can so, you do that across the country or just in New York State? So time? each state requires their own license. Yeah. Um, it's a, it was a big jump going from a BarkBox e-commerce. Yeah. You can do ship wherever you want to a highly regulated. Yeah. Um, you know, there's state regulations at pharmacy, state regulations on the medical side, um, FDA regulations, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So we started just building the pharmacy in New York. Uh, we hired our first pharmacist, Colin, who is licensed in New York and Pennsylvania. And we slowly got more and more licenses that allowed us to, to ship to other states. Uh, but yeah, initially it was just, I think, uh, two or three states uh, when we launched uh, that we could start servicing. And then how do you like how how do you think about marketing at row versus barkbox because it's very different right yeah. like um like one is instagram friendly the other is probably not instagram friendly yeah or, yeah you know harder you know yeah like, what were no, the no. differences between it, i mean there were so many differences but there were also so many similarities which is which was interesting where it's like i felt like i built my playbook at barkbox where it's like okay i know how to do channels do creative development i know how we're going to optimize or landing page do email Excuse me, um, but now is in this much highly, much more highly regulated environment. And so, like the biggest change initially was none of the platforms let us run ads. Like, mm. was there even <laughs> legit script back then or true pill? Legit script, um, yes. Legit script was actually one of the first accreditations we got that helped helped give the networks more comfort. Yeah, um, but we did not get an opportunity like. Facebook wouldn't let us run ads. Instagram wouldn't, you know, Facebook and Instagram wouldn't let us run ads. Google, we got shut down every couple of weeks. Um, so it was this constant cat and mouse where, like, I remember we've been live for like a month. We we're coming up on like holiday weekend. It was Thanksgiving. Google just shut down the account. And the only communication we got was like, we do not support your uh, business model. I'm sorry. And we we're like, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so over the course of like literally 12 hours, the tech team, completely rebuilt the website, new domain, got it pushed, applied for a new certification on Google, got approved, and we got back up and running. Um, but it wasn't until we were able to actually get in like the room with the Google team and the and the Facebook team and talk with them about what we were doing. We had all of the best healthcare medical advisors across the world, Z's dad brought in all these really well-known people. We could talk to them what we're building and why it's important, how it's safe and like the checks we're taking, the legitimacy, and slowly brought these people along. It's the same thing with every channel. We try to go out to podcasters. No one wanted to touch this. I don't want to talk about erectile dysfunction on my show. Like yeah. people are gonna think oh, I have that. And like, right. and so it took a lot of work to get people comfortable with what we were doing. And once we were able to unlock the channels, you could start to deploy the playbook. But that was one of the big early challenges, is just no one wanted uh, no one wanted to run our type of ads. Um, and so once we were able to kind of get that moving, things things really started to take off. And so now has that been unlocked? You're able to run Google ads, Facebook ads, anything you want? 
Yeah. Um, primarily, yeah. I mean, you know, and Roe has grown into much more than where it started sure. on the men's health side, has a really big uh, wellness uh, practice, has a really big um, weight management and dermatology and mental health and fertility practice. So there's a lot, there's a lot more than where we just were at that time. Um, but yeah, it was certainly, certainly a big challenge early, early on. How did you, um, recruit such killers? Like the three people that I know outside of you are Mike Miller, Neil Walker, and Jans. And all three are just killers at mm -hmm. what they do. And I've always, probably for the last like, uh, seven years, I've thought you guys are incredible at hiring. How'd you guys hire such good talent? I think that's something we, I think one really proud of, and even outside of just growth, I love those three guys. I'm happy to talk more about them. But I think across the board, we ruthlessly prioritize bringing in great people. And so like there's people that have been there four, five, six years still um, that I think are the best at their function in the country. Um, and, you know, when it comes to growth, I think what was really unique, especially at that time, and even now, like you don't see a lot of people, the founder level that come through growth that have like that type of background. And so I felt like I was able to recruit them at a founder level for a functional position where people are like, all right, this company gets it. It's not like, oh, you've got a good relationship with the founders is like, I'm the found, I'm one of the founders of the company. Like you've got cover, like let's go build this thing. So Mike, I remember meeting, he was our rep on a content uh, like doing some content early on. And then he was like, ah, I quit. I think I'm going to go play poker in Vegas. And I was <laughs> like, Mike Miller, hold on one minute. Before you do that, just come hang out here. Just come hang out here. Help us. We've got some stuff to do. We're slowly able to trick him into staying nice. uh, long term. Um, deception is the answer. <laughs> yeah, deception and inception. Both <laughs> important That's such a Mike Miller uh, path. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, but I'll, that's like the right path it's the right mentality you want for like growth people is you want like gamblers. You want yeah. people that like want to win big and are willing to take some risks and some swings. And Mike did an awesome job. He was my first hire in the growth team. And then, yeah, Yan, you know, Yan Gepson from early June, early June.com. Um, he was just always an SEM guy. He was like loved search. And I wanted someone that was like a true ninja on the search side. And he had spent like 15 years of his career just doing Google search. And I was yeah. like, wow. I'm pretty confident that if search is going to work, we want a guy like this who like knows what he's doing. Um, so yeah, I think that was like a bit of a secret weapon on the hiring side from a growth perspective where I could go in and give people comfort that like we understand growth, we understand how it works. Yeah. Um, and especially early on, we were like a mark, a growth marketing company that was doing healthcare. I think that shifted over time, but like we really re hit the ground running and we had some really good people still have great people there that, that know how to grow businesses. How has it shifted over time? I think over time, um, you know, you know, Roe started as Roman, the men's health company yeah. and has really, you know, transitioned into Roe, which is broadly a it's a hospital. It's a virtual hospital. You can go in, you can get seen for men's health issues, for fertility issues, for weight management issues. And I think with that, it has also helped broaden the messaging and the, um, and the channels that we wound up using to tell that story. Um, I think it's also, you know, even more important to be buttoned up in this highly regulated environment and making sure, you know, you're putting ad copy out there. Has a doctor reviewed it? Has a lawyer reviewed it? Like yeah. we want to make sure that we're putting things out in the world that we stand behind because every single thing gets scrutinized and you assume that any ad you put out there, someone at a regulatory body is taking a look at it. So we spent a tremendous amount of time after after initial push to make sure we we're going through a process of review where everything we put out into the world, we, we would feel comfortable standing So today, by. So basically today, before you launch an ad, a legal has to review that ad. There's a process where legal and medical are part of it. Okay. It's less of, the evolution there was less of like, it's a sequential workflow where yeah. like creative That's puts good. it together and then sends it to legal and then they send it to medical and then it gets published. That was kind of a nightmare. There's pods that actually just work collaboratively wow. together where legal is like, oh, I understand what we're trying to do don't use those words and medicals. Like I also understand, you know, the spirit of what we're trying to say, but I would think about positioning it this way. And so it's much more of a collaborative That's process fantastic. than it is like sequential. a sequential review. The sequential review 
is brutal. Yeah, yeah. is brutal. It's interesting uh, that you can find lawyers who are like have the mentality of being like, I understand what you want to do. Let's do it this way. Yeah. Like usually, you know, the lawyer is like, I never get in trouble. It will. I won't get in trouble if I say no. Right. You don't do it. You know what never happens is we launch something and I get in trouble. If we do do it and something goes wrong, I can get in trouble. So lawyers are always like, no, don't do yeah, it. Yeah, and it took an evolution of yeah. not just the people, but the process yeah. and the, and defining the risk tolerance at certain levels for the yeah. company. And, and the risk tolerance is very low. Like it's it's very conservative and always want to make sure that like, we, again, stand behind everything and it holds up to scrutiny. But it requires that collaborative effort, I think, to come to a good spot. Yeah. Are, sorry. No, go ahead. Are a lot of the ads that are working today still are they the same concepts, same strategy, same positioning as what worked when you launched? So to be fair, I'm out. I'm out of the day to day. You know, I stepped back over a year ago, um, so I'm less plugged into what's working now. I know, you know, there's different focuses on different product lines now. Early on, it was very much about men's health, erectile dysfunction. Um, now there's a lot more balance between those ads and more of like weight management pieces that are coming out, et cetera. So I think. There's a shift in areas of um, advertising, but also I would say kind of just like tone and brand overall as, as that has shifted into more of like the row brand. And that's very different than like any, any of those individually. Got it. Uh, I know we got to wrap up in a couple minutes. I just want to ask a couple of last questions. One is, um, why did you leave, bro? You said you've been out of the day to day. I know you're on the board, but you're no longer like, you know, day to day. I think. Yeah. Why is that the case? Yeah, you know, it'd been what almost, you what do you, what would you say you do? Um, so, you know, it had been almost six years yeah. um, and an incredible run and like yeah. wouldn't change it for the world. I think where my co-founders and I, as we spend time talking through it and I kind of like reflected and I realized the initial, you know, the initial um, growth of the company came a lot from like performance and the playbook and all the things we were doing and it started to shift. Growth, growth for Row will be still, of course, doing those things, but also much more about like medical innovation, healthcare innovation, pharma partnership innovation, like all these things that are incredibly important for the growth of the company and and are happening and are really exciting. But also things I think, if I'm honest with myself, I'm just I'm less naturally drawn towards. Yeah, and so it was like a you know it was a tough decision, but I think I didn't want to. To, uh, I didn't want to hang around the rim, if that makes sense. Just like be there. Yeah. Um, if I didn't feel like I was actually pushing in the right direction and also giving the team what they needed out of that, out of that role. So, you know, I'd kind of been thinking about that. And then I got this bug in my head where I was like, what if I do nothing for a while? That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's the best. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I have young kids and just decided, you know what? There's never a good time to do anything. I'm going to take a breath. And I'm going to step back from day to day. I'm going to try and focus on being a human being again um, and like reintegrating back into, into society and see what happens. Yeah. And so first couple of months, I didn't do a lot of business stuff. I said no to like any sort of meeting or coffee. And I tried to learn guitar and I took magic lessons and all sorts of nerdy stuff, read a lot of books um, and then exit life. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Just trying to, just trying to take advantage of the opportunity to take a breath. Like yeah. you're so, and you guys know you're hustling all the time and like, it's hard to appreciate those times that you have. So, and then as I step back in, I'm kind of splitting my time between a few things. Um, I'm, I've just taken over, I'm the chair of a, a nonprofit, a homeless shelter out in mm. Jersey called Isaiah house, isaiahouse.org. Take a look. Uh, fantastic team and get an opportunity to like flex some of my skills in that area. Um, I'm doing some consulting right now, some growth marketing consulting, um, spending time actually a little bit more on the sports side. We did a lot of, with Roman with, um, sports sponsorships and partnerships. Um, and so I'm starting to help companies that are thinking about how to work with teams and leagues. Um, and then I'm working on snagged snagged as, as Nick knows is my, uh, domain acquisition business. That's just something I've always been like, a real nerd about. I love helping people get hard to find digital assets. Did and you have any cool domain stories in your back pocket? I have so many. I have so many. We What's the most expensive domain you've like, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're acquiring them and reselling I'm, them. I'm mostly helping companies that say like, hey, we're a series B now. We need yeah. the .com. Yeah. Help us figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I've got some pretty wild stories. I won't say which property oh, this sure. was, but um, 
got in contact with a guy who owned this property and he was like post-economic. He's like, I saw the company. I don't need anything yeah. ever. And I was like, is there something creative we could do together? Like, like something that's important to you? And we went back and forth and realized this guy was on the board of a nonprofit that built water wells in South America. And I was like, huh. I was like, could we help you build a new water well? And he was like, oh, that's interesting. And so long story short, basically wound up getting funds from a lot of different places. And we helped sponsor building this uh, well uh, in Brazil uh, that for a very small village. And he would like send us pictures and videos and updates. And we did that in exchange for this asset. It was like wow. kind of wild. Where <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, cool. sometimes you just have to go really deep and be super creative to get these things because um, they're like the original NFTs. Like yeah, a I've good heard, domain I've heard name. like people will get other people's kids into college to get a domain. <laughs> Wow, I've heard that story. I mean, yeah, they also have to be um, a rower. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they have to <laughs> And it's only USC. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, sometimes you have to get creative with this stuff. It's kind of a, this wild world. I've always just loved. I'd love going down the rabbit hole and figuring out how to make these deals happen. So I went up launching Snag Snag dot com, where um, I've been doing a fair amount of business on that as well. Uh, and how should people get in touch? If people want to get in touch with you, are you active on Twitter? Should they reach out to you on LinkedIn? Should they go to snack.com? What should they do? Sure. You can always uh, catch me on Twitter. I'm just at Rob. So you can catch me there. That is a great. Um, look at you already getting good handles on Twitter. Well, well. You, you know, I've been in the game. and Or you can just email me. Hi at Rob.com. That works too. Damn. Wow. Okay. That's a Make great way to add. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's and Nick's Nick.co, you know? Well, yeah. we're, we're going to work on it. We're going to work on it. Uh, I'm on the poor people side. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. got to go to snag.com. We'll get you. Let's build a water well for you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me, guys. Fantastic. Really appreciate you. Yeah, this was awesome. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next time to cut through the noise in CPG, retail, and e-commerce. And if you enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with a friend? And be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on.